John chapter 11. John chapter 11. A very well-known story. Something we're very familiar with. I'm going to talk to us tonight on the topic of glad I missed it. Glad I missed it. Beginning at verse 1. And we'll read through verse 16. If we'd stand tonight in honor of the reading of God's Word, I read from the King James text. Yes, I'm one of them. I kind of like the old King James. Works to be. Now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a re of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And listen to this next line. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Oh, hallelujah. To the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. <laughs> Oh, you always got those naysayers, don't you? You always got those that can see the negative side regardless of what you're doing. Amen. Glad I missed it. Would you bow your heads with me? King Jesus, we love you tonight. God, your word is the most important thing in our life today. For God, tonight it's from your word that we gather nourishment and we gather sustenance for our souls. Lord Jesus, as the bread of life would be broken tonight, we ask God that your anointing would rest heavily upon your messenger. Help us, God, to deliver that word that you place in my heart, that those that are in this place, those that will hear this message on the internet, those that will hear it by tape, will be blessed and encouraged, uplifted and helped. God, there's nothing that I could say that could be of any benefit to anyone outside of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And tonight, God, I lean so heavily on you, set a fire in my soul that I might declare your word with boldness and with power from on high, that the hearer might know they're hearing from God and not merely from the messenger. Master, grant all that I've asked for, ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated tonight. Isn't it funny that the Lord is never in a hurry? He's never rushed by circumstances regardless of how dire they may seem to us. He is never hurried because God is God when he gets there, as the black preacher said. He's always God when he gets there, brother. It doesn't matter whether he gets there early or he gets there late. He's still God when he gets there. Hallelujah. Have you ever been somewhere and as you arrive you find out that something had just happened that you really weren't too thrilled about, and you say, well, gee, I'm glad I missed it. I'm glad I got here a little late, and I wasn't here to see that. Maybe some family members were fighting or fretting, or somebody got into a tussle or something, and you say, well, I'm glad I missed that. Sometimes there are benefits to arriving on the scene just a little bit late. Amen? I want you to know tonight that there are many times that God is saying, I'm so glad I missed it. I'm so glad I didn't get there any earlier. I'm so glad I didn't arrive on the scene any sooner than I did. Because by coming when I did, there was greater opportunity for a miracle. There was greater opportunity for our faith to be challenged. There was greater opportunity for our faith to grow and to become something. 
any more than it was before we started. Oh, I'm glad I missed it. Jesus spoke to his disciples of the death of Lazarus, and they did not understand that he was speaking of this young man's death. They thought, oh, well, he's asleep. He's been sick, so if he's sleeping, should we leave him alone and just let him sleep? Isn't that funny? You know, we human beings are a riot, aren't we? If God didn't have a sense of humor, I swear heaven would crack, because we are just a bunch of goofs. Well, Lord, if he's sleeping, let's just leave him alone. You know, hey, he'll get better that way. And the Lord has to speak plainly. How many times God tried to tell us something, we don't get it, until he finally has to speak plainly. Amen. Until he finally has to make it black and white and say, listen, dummy, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Listen to him. He's not sleeping. He's dead. Oh, he's dead. Oh, now I get it. Yeah, uh-huh. And now you want to go. We've been sitting here flaking around for two days, and now you want to go. Now that he's dead, and you know the Jews bury their folks within 24 hours, so, Lord, you know, of course, the boy's been buried already. He's already in his grave, but you want to go now. Mm, okay, well, see, we kind of would have thought it might have been a good idea to go and visit him while he was living. <laughs> Amen. We kind of thought it would be a good idea to go see him while he was still breathing, you know, and had a little bit of life in him, and then you could have worked some of your glorious miracle working power on him, you know, and zap, and he'd have been healed. What makes you think I can't heal him where he's at now? What makes you think tonight God can't give you a miracle where you're at now? What makes you think tonight that your circumstance and your situation is so dire that God cannot do for you what you need God to do? Hallelujah. We've been praying around here for some financial miracles because we got some things to take care of. And it gets to the point sometimes where I say, Lord, are you ever going to move on this thing? And the Lord just answers back, when I move, it'll be done. When I do it, it'll be done. You don't have to worry about the time, all you've got to worry about is believe in me. Because if you can hold out and believe in spite of the circumstance, in spite of the situation, when you get to the end of this tunnel, you'll have a greater faith and a stronger faith than you had going in. Amen. I like to teach our people sometimes God wants you to flex your faith muscle. Amen. Just like when you work out. You know, the only time you benefit when you're lifting weights is when you're pushing against the resistance. So sometimes God has to let our circumstance kind of expand and last a little bit longer than we care for it to so that we can continue to believe against the circumstance and we can continue to flex our muscle against the resistance so that when we come to the end of that experience, our faith is stronger than it was when we went in. Amen. That's why God's never in a hurry. It's not because he's trying to give us another break down, although sometimes I wonder. But it's because he's trying to help us to push against the resistance, hallelujah, and believe him in spite of every circumstance, so that when it's all over, our faith is at a higher plane than it was when we started. Amen. Don't you want to have greater faith tonight than you did last night? Amen. Don't you want your faith today to be greater than it was yesterday? Amen. I know people got the same faith they had the day they prayed through. And they can't believe God for nothing. Because they've never had to push against the resistance. They've never worked that faith muscle. Glory to God. You know, I don't think it was an accident that the Lord said, that if we would have faith as the size of the grain of a mustard seed. I don't think it was an accident that the Lord used that illustration because I believe what he was saying simply was this, that faith is similar to that seed. And if you'll sow that seed and if you'll flex that muscle, when it's all said and done, you're not going to have a seed, you're going to have a plant. Hallelujah. You're going to have something entirely different than what you started with. You're going to have something far more majestic, far more grand than what you started with. But you start out with this little grain, this little tiny thing. You ever seen a mustard seed? It looks about like a fleck of pepper, don't it? It's so tiny and so small. But from that grows this enormous plant, this great big glorious plant. And I believe God is trying to raise up a people in these last days that have faith, that can believe him for great things. I believe that as the enemy comes in and they 
tribulation period begins, that God's church is going to begin to manifest miracles like we've never seen before in the entire history of the church. Amen. I believe we're going to make Peter and Paul look like Peter, Paul, and Mary because they're not even going to be able to uh, compare with what God's church is going to be doing. Folks, we're in a time today when you barely ever see a healing in the church anymore. I hear about more things that are happening to God's people. This one had cancer and had surgery, and this one had cancer and had an me, and this one had this, and this one had that. And I think, God, 30 years ago when I was a child in the Pentecostal church, we'd get around somebody and pray them through till God healed their body. What has happened to the church that now we're hearing about how people made it through this surgery and made it through that situation and made it through this? What's wrong with our faith? Where's it at? Amen. Jesus said, when the Lord returns, will he find faith in the earth? Isn't that what he said? Amen. But you see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is not a mistake tonight that faith is lacking in the church because the word of God is lacking in the church. We've got more preachers preaching opinion. We've got more preachers preaching their own hard, heartless, uh, heavy, and condemnatory messages rather than preaching the uplifting, glorious news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why there's no faith. Because the word of God, there's a famine in the land, not of bread or of water, but of the hearing of the word of God. And if they preach the word like they're supposed to, God's people would be raising the dead. They'd be laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. They'd be casting demons out of the oppressed, and the world would stand in awe. We got TV ministries think that the world will be impressed if we have gold thrones for all the preachers to sit in. We've got to imitate Hollywood for the world to be impressed. Well, Mr. Crouch, I've got news for you. You ever get enough of the Holy Ghost, you can lay hands on a dead man and see life come back into his body. The world will be impressed. You ever get enough of the Holy Ghost in you so that you can lay hands on someone with a cancer in their body and God removes it and there's not so much as a scar or a sign that it ever existed. The world will be impressed. You ever get enough of the Holy Ghost in you that you can speak the name of Jesus to a demoniac and see that demoniac delivered. I'll tell you, the world will be impressed and they won't care if you're sitting on folding chairs. Lord have mercy. I get so tired of the foolishness that's going on in God's church today. We're so busy trying to impress the world with worldly things. The world doesn't want worldly things. When they come to the house of God, they want God. Hallelujah. They don't come to church, brother, to buy dimes. They come to church to find Jesus. And it's the same when you come to church nowadays. We've got gold. We've got silver. We've got diamonds and rubies. But where's the power of God? Where's the presence of the Holy Ghost? Where is God to deliver and to heal and to save? Amen. Oh, I tell you, I remember pastoring my very first church many years ago. 22 years ago, roughly. And I remember I was just a kid. Didn't know anything about pestering. Was terrified out of my mind, 18 years old. Say, yeah, you do the math, you know my age, okay. And I remember people would come into our church and be healed, brother. I saw more healings in that church than I... I'd never seen, I think, in all my life. And I was raised in a good church, had a lot of faith, and we saw people healed in the church I was raised in all the time. We had a little Catholic lady one time called the church I grew up in, said, I hear you all believe that God answers prayer. And she said, would you all pray for me? I've been diagnosed with cancer, and they haven't given me much time. And uh, our pastor said, well, Yes, ma'am, we will pray for you, and we will believe God for a miracle for you, and we did. I got news for you. God healed that lady. And you know what she did? 
She stepped up out of the Catholic Church and walked into that little Assemblies of God and got the Holy Ghost and became a member of our church and, and knew what it was to walk in the power of God. See, that's what transforms lives. That's what changes minds. That's what illuminates people's path. The power of God, not the gold and the silver and the shine and the sheen. My Lord, have mercy. Whew, I guess I'm trying, aren't I? Amen. I, I want you to know tonight, God is never in a rush. He is never rushed, no matter how dire our circumstance. He's as much God when he, when uh, Lazarus has died as he was when Lazarus was only sick. Amen. He's still God, brother, whether you're sick or he's God when you're dead. It doesn't matter either way. He's still God. Hallelujah. Whether your circumstance is mild or whether your circumstance is severe, he's still God tonight. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. I remember the story in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. And the same day when the even was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Oh, Lord, have mercy. How many times we question why it is the Lord doesn't prevent the storm. But he's as much God, and he's as much able to quiet the storm as he is able to prevent the storm. Hallelujah. He might have been awake when the storm was just brewing, and he could have settled the storm before it became a tempest. But he was equally as able to quell the tempest as it reached its height as he was able to quell the storm before it became such a great peril. Amen. You see, God's able, Mother, to quell the storm in a highest level, just as quickly as he's able to prevent the storm from coming at all. And we, talk, we keep crying out to God, oh God, prevent the storm, oh God, prevent the storm, oh God, send the storm, hallelujah, my faith needs a test, I need to exercise that muscle, glory to God, don't get here too early, give me a little time to work this thing out. Hallelujah. Glory to God, amen, and it's funny. Many of us don't realize that as the Lord stood on that boat that day and declared those wonderful words, peace be still, he was speaking directly from the Psalms. He was speaking directly as David had warned in Psalm 83, verses 1 through 5. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace. And be not still. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hold not thy peace and be not still. So the God that David was addressing in Psalm 83 stood up on the boat and borrowed his words and said, Peace, be still, glory to God. I will not hold my peace and I will not be still, but you will. Glory to God. Oh, listen now. Keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult. And they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. If we would remember today, that that storm was every bit as much against the Lord as it was against the disciples. It was as big a threat on the Lord's life as it was the disciples' life. Amen. 
You see, you can't attack God's people, but God don't feel it. Come on now. You can't come against God's people and think that God ain't feeling the pain of what God's people are going through. When the enemy thinks he's going to come against the people of God, he often forgets that he's coming against the God of the people. Because you can't come against one without coming against the other. Glory to God. My big brother, my father, he stands behind me. He stands ever ready to defend me. I want you to know, devil, when you try to mess with me, you're going to have to mess with him. Glory to God. If Satan ever, oh, listen to this now. If this don't make you happy, nothing will. If you ain't never shouted while a preacher's preaching, you're going to shout tonight. If Satan ever had a hand in trying to destroy the Lord, it was surely as the Lord lay in that boat sleeping. Satan was trying with all his might to destroy Jesus. Why? To prevent Calvary. Oh, yes, you listen to me now. Satan knew that Calvary could not happen. <laughs> oh, he didn't rejoice the day that Jesus hung on the cross. Contrary to the notions of many preachers and the lyrics of many songwriters, Satan shrunk in fear and he shook in terror with every step the Master took down that Via Dolorosa, hallelujah, toward that place that was called the place of the skull, hallelujah. The Word of God tells us that the enemy would bruise his heel, but he would bruise the enemy's head, hallelujah. And as the cross was lowered into its hole on Calvary's hill, a knife was driven through the skull of the enemy. Oh, hallelujah. Do you hear me? As the cross was lowered into the hole on Calvary, the place of the skull, then the Lord bruised the head of the enemy. Glory to God. Right through the skull went the cross, and victory came to God's people. Oh, glory. The devil wasn't interested in watching the Lord die on that cross. He wanted to do everything he could to prevent that from ever happening. He started when the Lord was just born, trying to destroy the infants, the children, under two years of age, under old Herod. Amen. He tried to destroy the Lord. He tried to tempt him. Hey, why don't you leap off this pillar? The Word of God says, of course, the Lord wasn't stupid. He knew. He said, yeah, I know what the Bible says, but I also know the Bible says you don't tempt God. The Bible also tells me you don't do something stupid and expect God to cover your back just because you have a notion to do something stupid. Come on now, children. Amen. A lot of us won't go out there and do stupid things and expect God to cover our back when all the while we know we're doing something stupid. It don't work that way. Amen. But if in the, in the process of your journey you happen to do something stupid and you didn't do it intentionally but it kind of happened, God will cover you. Amen. Because thank God the Lord makes up for my mistakes. Or I'd be in a hole so deep I couldn't get out. Amen. I want you to know today, the Lord didn't have to prevent that storm from occurring because he was as much God after the storm as he was before the storm. He was able to quell the storm as quickly as he would have been able to prevent the storm. In Job, we read a story of, of the man Job. The Word of God tells us in verses 6 through 8, chapter 1 of Job, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? If you remember my message this morning, we talked about a perfect Man, amen, and what that means. Somebody who's done everything they know to do. When God put something before them to do, they didn't say, no, I don't want to do that. I prefer not to have to do that. I'd rather just lean on what I've already done. No, they say, Lord, I hear you, and I'll do it, amen. God, I see what you require of me, and I'll do it, amen. When God speaks, I would pay if I had it a million dollars tonight. If it would mean that all the people God has spoken to that should be in the service tonight would be here. But you see, God speaks. Lord told me years ago, he said, I'm going to talk to people all over the country, and I'm going to tell them to come and to be a part of your work here. 
I said, okay, Lord, glory, that'll work. I'll take that. And I've had dozens of people in the last four years contact me and say, God spoke to me to come to Dallas. Well, praise the Lord. Come on. I'll give you a place to stay. I'll help you every way I can to get situated here in town. Just come on. And you know what? Not a one of them has ever arrived. See, so God speaks to a lot of people, and yet they don't listen. And yet they think they're going to make heaven one day. My Lord, have mercy. But you know what? I don't find the disobedient in heaven. Amen. I find the obedient. I find the perfect. I find those who do all that God asked them to do. I find, you know, somebody said tonight, the Lord said to go to church, so we're going to go to church. Amen. Because you got to do what God tells you to do. Amen. It's not time to question. It's not time to argue. It's time to obey. When God tells you, there must be something there for you. I don't know if this preacher's got it coming out of his mouth right now or not, but there's got to be something here for you tonight if God told you to come. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I want you to know the Lord might have prevented Job's trials. He might have prevented Job's trials by telling the devil, no, you can't try Job. But our God is God before, during, and after the trial. He is able to restore that which we have lost. He is able to heal that which is unhealthy. He is able to mend that which is broken. When our faith is increased, strengthened, and multiplied by our storms and our trials, we will be grateful to God for His having missed the opportunity to arrive on the scene sooner. You hear me now? When our faith is greater, brother, for the trial we've gone through, when our faith is greater for the trouble we have endured, we'll be grateful that God arrived and said, Glad I missed it. Amen. The Lord said to his disciples that day as he was telling them of Lazarus' death, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. I'm glad I missed it. Because by my missing being there at an earlier time, I gave you an opportunity for your faith to grow. By my not being there at an earlier time, I gave you an opportunity to increase your faith. I gave you an opportunity to see a miracle that would boggle the minds of the world. Hallelujah. That at my very word, I could call a dead body from the grave. Glory to God. Oh, I want you to know, children, God, when he lets things get worse and worse and worse, what he's doing is he's setting up a bigger and a bigger and a bigger miracle. Hallelujah. Do you hear me now? When God lets the circumstance grow even more and more dire, all he's doing is setting the devil up for a greater victory. He could have given us a victory yesterday, but it would have been a full victory. Let's wait a month and he'll give us a glorious victory. He'll give us a big victory. He'll give us a victory. We can shout down the aisles of God's house for. Glory to God. Say, Lord, why are you waiting? He says, well, because I'm glad I missed the opportunity to be there sooner. Because by missing the opportunity to be there sooner, you have the opportunity to witness a greater miracle and a greater blessing. My Lord, have mercy. Are you blessed tonight? Amen. Is the word of the Lord telling you something? I hope so. I want to read to you more of that story of Lazarus. John chapter 11, verse 33 through 44, the word of the Lord reads, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. You remember Lazarus' sister had come to him and said, Lord, don't bother. He's dead. Oh, Lord, how many of us go to God and say, Lord, it's too late now. And he said, you don't know who I am, do you? Amen. If you knew who I was, you'd know that the words, it's too late, don't, they don't even fit in my vocabulary. The words, it's too late, don't even belong in the vocabulary of God's church tonight. Do you hear me? The words, it's too late, should never be uttered from our lips, because for God, it's never too late. Hallelujah. And in his spirit, the Bible said he was troubled. I'm going to tell you, we don't make God happy when we approach him in unbelief. We don't make God happy when we approach Him with a fearful mindset and a, and a faithless mindset. And then the Lord said, Where have you laid Him? They said unto Him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Shortest scripture in the entire Word of God. Jesus wept. 
not for the fact that Lazarus is dead, because Jesus knows what Jesus can do. He wasn't crying because Lazarus was dead. He was crying because those he loved didn't believe him. They didn't have confidence in him. I wonder how many times God sits on the throne and looks down at us as we scream out to him, It's too late! And he weeps and says, Oh, Chuck, you're not believing me. You're not trusting me. You're not understanding that I'm God when I get there. But when I get there, I'm going to give you the biggest miracle you've ever seen. Honey, I've had more nervous breakdowns waiting on money to come in. Oh, I'm telling you, oh, yes. I, one thing this preacher is is human, and I'll admit as quick as anybody, I, I cannot, I hate finances. I wish to God God's church could operate without money because it would thrill me to death. I'm not a good fundraiser, don't like it, never have liked it. But I'll tell you, there have been times when the pressure would get so hot, brother, I'd be cussing every which way but upside down. Golly, God, I don't understand what's going on. It's too late, God, you haven't come. If you haven't come now, you're never going to come. It's never going to happen. And then it seemed like the next day, the Lord just waiting for me to crack. The next day, here comes that $5,000 check in the mail. And I'm sitting there like a fool saying, Lord, I'm sorry, Jesus. I, Lord, you know, I knew the whole time that... <laughs> I knew the whole while you were going to come through, Lord, and I really did, you know. I was really believing you, Jesus. See, that nervous break down, that was just kind of the force of hand, you know. I figured if I cussed a little, you'd finally throw me some money and help us out of this man. But you see, without fail, God never fails. He is the God that never fails. Amen. He was the God that went into the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was the God that stood with them because they stood for him. Hallelujah. He was the God that went into the lion's den with Daniel and shut the mouth of the lions because Daniel refused to concede and he refused to give in and he refused to do things the world's way. Hallelujah. But he was going to do things the same way he always done. I want you to know tonight, consistency pays. Hallelujah. It don't hurt go to church every time you get a chance. But I'll tell you what, you try staying out enough and see if it don't hurt. Come on now. You see, if you don't miss two or three services, if it don't become easier and easier to miss the fourth one and the fifth one and the sixth one, and all of a sudden you've been out of church for ten years. You see, so consistency pays. I want you to know the word of the Lord said, Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Yeah, when the Lord's crying, they see that as, Oh, he really loved Lazarus. And some of, this, some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? This guy has healed blind people. Couldn't he have prevented Lazarus from dying? Yes, he could have, but he's glad he missed it. Because by missing it, now you're going to see something better than the eyes of the blind being open. You're going to see something better than the sick being healed. Honey, get ready. You're about to see the dead being raised. Hallelujah. That's the word of our God. Glory to God. Listen to this. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself. Oh, every time he hears somebody say, couldn't he have done it then? But I'm not so sure he can do it now. Every time God hears us say something that sounds like, Lord, you could have taken care of it then, but now it's too late. He starts groaning in himself. And the word of the Lord goes on to tell us, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, 
bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Hallelujah. He's still God, brother, when he gets there. It doesn't matter whether you're sick or whether you're dead. It doesn't matter whether your circumstance is bad or whether it's worse. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter whether your circumstance is measly or whether it's, it's mountainous today. God is God when he gets there. Hallelujah. And sometimes he's glad he missed it. Sometimes he says, hi, I'm here now, and I'm glad I missed it. I'm glad I didn't get here sooner because now you're going to see the glory of God broken loose. Hallelujah. And you're going to see the enemy destroyed by the hand of the Almighty. Glory to God. Do you believe that tonight? Woo, Jesus, help us, Lord. God, we're believing you. Everybody in this room has got something they're believing God for. I know that. I know because we're humans. And human beings are about the most needy things I've ever seen. Amen. We're needy, aren't we? God's people, we're needy people. We constantly come into church. You ask for prayer requests. Everybody got their hand up. Ask for testimonies, and everybody's sitting there. And you're, is she going to survive? But the Bible said we're made overcomers by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. You see, my friend, tonight, it's not about, it's, it's not at all about what we can ask God for. It's what we can thank God for. You hear me now? If we learn to thank God, I'll tell you what, He'll give you more and more to thank Him for. You hear me? Amen. You thank God for one thing, He'll start pouring out more. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship or not. Some of us have, some of us haven't, I guess. I don't know. And if you ever notice, when you're in a relationship, you know, and you decide you're going to be all romantic and sweet, and you bring home flowers, you know, for your sweetie, or you bring home a nice little card from Hallmark, you know, or one of them other cheapies, and you bring that home to your partner, your mate, and you hand it over, and, and they're just so appreciative, and they just are so grateful for that little gesture. And boy, I'll tell you what, you just you want to run out the next minute and buy them another one. Don't you? Amen. Oh, the next day you're thinking, I'm going to buy more flowers. Well, within a week, your home looks like a funeral home. Because you just, you just love that gratitude. You just love that good feeling that you get, you know, from all that appreciation. Don't you know today, the Bible said God inhabits the praises of his people. When we thank God for what he's done, when we thank God for the good things and the great things that he's done, he'll do more. Amen. Because he is trying to rule us. He's trying to help us to understand that he loves us. I want you to know, I don't care what First Baptist Church is saying tonight. I don't care what First First you be seen and say in the night, God don't hate you. God's not against you. God loves you. Hallelujah. And he's trying to rule you into the kingdom of God. It is the greatness of God that leadeth men unto repentance. Hallelujah. It's not condemnation and guilt. It's the goodness of God that leadeth men under repentance. It's the flowers and the candy that he gives to rule us into his presence and into a loving relationship with himself. Oh, hallelujah. Woo, I don't know about you, I feel good. Amen. I think this was a positive word tonight. Amen. Would you stand with me? Amen. I don't know what you're facing tonight in your life. I don't know what circumstances you're looking down the gun barrel of. But I want to tell you, God's God, when that gun is pointed at you and he's God after the bullet's been fired. Do you hear me? Amen. He's able to raise the dead as quickly and as easily as he's able to heal the sick. Your circumstance is by no means beyond God's control. It is by no means beyond God's ability. He can do it. Like the old song says, I know my God can do it. To him, there's nothing to it. I know he'll see me through to sweet victory, even though the storms are raging. He is my rock of ages. I know my God can do it. Mighty is he. Amen. I want to tell you tonight, he's able, but more than able, he's willing. Do you hear me? He's willing. He wants to do it for you because he loves you. 
He cares about you. God don't like watching us squirm in circumstances. He doesn't like watching us have to go through the fire. But at the same time, just like a parent, we don't always like watching our baby fall on the floor as they're trying to learn to walk. But if they don't fall a few times, they're never going to walk. Amen. You don't learn the importance of staying on your feet if you don't get to fall a few times. After you fall a couple of times, you realize, you know what, I think I better stay standing up. Because I don't like my bum getting black and blue every time I fall. Amen. So sometimes God lets us endure the hardness. That's why the scripture said endure hardness as a good soldier. Amen. When you've done all you can, stand. If you can't do nothing else, sister, if you can't move forward, stand still. Amen. I know there's a lot of preachers tell you that if you're not moving forward with God, you're not in the will of God. That's a lie. As long as you're able to stand, honey, you're in the will of God. You don't have to move nowhere. As long as you're able to stand, you're in the will of God. As long as the devil had knocked you down and knocked you out and caused you to quit believing God, then, honey, you're where God wants you to be. You've kept the faith. You've fought a good fight. And there is now laid up for you a crown of life. Hallelujah. Master, tonight in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful anointing of the Holy Ghost that we feel in this place. Tonight, God, a spirit of victory has been loosed in this building. Tonight, God, a spirit of victory has been loosed in the lives of everyone that is in this place to hear this message. Lord, all those that would hear it by the Internet, all those that would hear it by tape, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we loose the spirit of victory. The battle is won, hallelujah, for the enemy is not coming against God's people, but he is coming against God. The battle is not yours, but it belongs to the Lord tonight. Master, in the name of Jesus, we're believing you tonight for great things. Lord, yesterday you might have given us a small miracle, but today, today we need a great miracle. And God, we believe and we know that your everything is able to give us a great big miracle today. And you were able to give us a small miracle yesterday. God, we're believing you. Increase our faith. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Help us, God, today to believe you, to trust you, to lean on you wholly, and not to let the enemy of our soul convince us that it's too late. Because, Lord, it's never too late for our God. When you get there, it's a good time. When you get there, it's the right time. When you get there, God, you may be saying, I'm glad I missed it. Because now you have the opportunity to see an even greater miracle, to receive an even greater blessing. Master, in the name of Jesus, we just pray, God, that this spirit, this anointing would rest upon us. Go with us to our homes tonight. Help us to meditate upon your word, God. Let our faith be increased that it might become something greater and stronger and more powerful than anything we had yesterday. Oh God, change us and form us in your image, we pray. Master, tonight, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, we ask him in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. And amen. Glory to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Do you feel tonight like you heard from heaven? I hope so. Amen. I want to tell you, we, uh, we have a scrawny little chicken. We didn't know we were going to triple our congregation size in one night. So, <laughs> but we do have some eats, and we can go get some more if we have to. So we, we want you, if you want to, we'd love to have you stay with us and uh, have a bite to eat with us. We brought it tonight, and uh, we'd love to have you stay with us and fellowship with us and have something to eat and drink, okay? So you do that tonight if you would. We'd love to have you. Amen. If you've been blessed, just raise your hand. Let the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you tonight. In Jesus' name, you're dismissed. Go in peace. Amen.